sometimes people see me, oh, Cody Kessel, Princeton. I had to grind through so many of these underdog seasons. You know, not a lot of opportunities in high school. Got good on the beach and the grass, just grinding through these road dog summers on the beach and the grass. At uh, Princeton, we were always underdogs. You know, we snapped a 35 match losing streak to Penn State while I was there. We were the, you know, the first time we were in the top 15 and kind of changed the culture at a program there. And then also when I went overseas to play a year in Switzerland and three years in Lunenburg, I was never on a top team. And it wasn't until I got to Berlin that I kind of finally got to experience that and that and, and then chance to play for Tyler. I was not expecting this room to be so cold. In fact, I want to let you in on something. I, uh, I, mean, I, I don't know if you've like seen the house I have here. I have this like ridiculously amazing house that I scored on Airbnb. But part of the, my duty is I have to pay the electricity bill. And uh, he had mentioned, he was like, it's probably going to be around like 100 euros. And I was like, that's fine. I can pay out of pocket for like, you know, my living situation like that, you know, when it's, when it's like this and it's yeah. nice. And, and, uh, I get the bill for like mid December to end of January and it was 500 euros. And I know that like energy and gas is like so expensive right now because of the war going on and everything. Uh, but I couldn't believe it, dude. I was like, how, like, I keep this house at like, like, what do you like to keep your house at? You know, like it's, what's a good temp for you? It's the exact same. We had the exact same experience. I don't Fahrenheit. I'm I'm getting so confused between Fahrenheit and Celsius now, but it's like twenty something, you know, like twenty one, twenty two. That's hot. Celsius. That's Celsius, yeah, yeah. by the way, for people. Yes, <laughs> I have I have I have the same. I'm like, I uh, I keep mine exactly around like twenty one, twenty two. And I don't know what it was, but for some reason, my electricity bill was five hundred dollars, and I'm like, okay. Zane. Now we we gotta start figuring something out. You know, we need some like some tips for. I don't know how to be like energy efficient, but I have these like, like the wall heaters, but they like stick out a little bit and there's like a knob from one to five. And then they, I think they like slowly blow out air, but like the whole panel yeah. itself gets warm. I don't know, dude. It's a nightmare. We have the same, they, Germany also capped for large buildings, like in Max Schmeling Hall, where we play at 17. So it's super cold when we walk in the gym in the morning or when teams come to play uh wow as interesting you know, they as capped like a, it as a nas- nationwide energy saving thing for big public buildings like that so wow it's been real cold but uh yeah. dude that's gnarly i mean yeah our our practice gym was like 13 at one point it was unbelievable dude and Opa. and for those people like i always i always figured like playing in russia or playing somewhere where it was like really cold it was like okay like that's probably going to be a part of the experience, like your practice gym at least. But man, 13 degrees, I it's worth complaining. It's It was unbelievable. And that's what we did. We were yeah. like, and then eventually our president changed it because we were like, this is insane. Like breathing, when you're like huffing and puffing, breathing in cold air like that is so gnarly. Like, I don't know. I can't imagine like living somewhere, like maybe in like Alberta, Canada, where maybe they also don't have the resources for like a warm gym. Like, dude, that's so hardcore. Yeah respect respect to all those cold cold north ballers um also cody did you bring your coffee i got my coffee man what are we drinking just your normal like capsule coffee how about you like what an espresso you drink espresso yeah yeah i got a oh you got a little espresso espresso machine back there that's nice yeah dude i have my girlfriend's mug actually Oh, nice. There what is go. it? Hot. <laughs> what, what do you mean? It's her mug. Like she made it or like, no, she, we got each other. Her, she got me one that says sunshine. Actually, it should be your mug actually too. Wow. Yeah. Just, did she forget to hot. send that to me? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. That's great. Dude. I, I, feel, no, no. I, am, I am so ashamed of what I'm drinking right now. <laughs> I, uh, 
this like I'm gonna try to make this the smallest story ever, but basically like I do I used a catering service right now just for this week. I'm like trying it out where they send you all like five meals basically first thing in the morning and then you eat them and then the next morning like when you wake up there uh, there's a new set of meals waiting for you in front of your house and you pick it up and whatever and it's actually really convenient and pretty cheap and like it's been really great but um because of that I don't like go into the city anymore to like get groceries and do stuff and so I finished my coffee and last night I was like I'm gonna do a podcast with Cody in the morning like I'm gonna I know I'm gonna need some coffee and I went to the gas station because it was the only thing open. It was like down the street. And I got some like gas station Nestle <laughs> like uh, <laughs> instant coffee. And it is not good, dude. I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't know if like good tasting instant coffee exists. Um, but let me tell you, this is not it. And I tried. I was like, I was like, oh, how convenient instant coffee. Like you just dump it in there and it's ready to go. And like, <laughs> I, I did a little bit and I was like, ah, oh, it doesn't taste good. Let's add more. And now I'm just going to get <laughs> jacked up on like the worst coffee I've ever had. So cheers to that. All right. It's going to get us going, get us through this whole thing. I love it. It'll get us pumped up. Dude, how you doing by the way? I'm good, man. I'm good. Yeah. We, we just had a huge win at home to make it through uh, the play in match for champions league. So we qualified for the champions league quarterfinals. Sick. So we, made it through a, we made it through a really tough group. Uh, we in the play-in match we played Zirat, so the team that just picked up Juan Torreira and yeah. um, Nexi and Wouter Termat, and it was we were going to get. Usually you play home and away, and we were minutes from getting on the plane. We were in the airport, and then we got the news about the cancellations in Turkey from the earthquakes and how there weren't going to be matches played anymore and. Of course, we made our way out of the airport. Our bags were already on the plane, but we figured it all out. And and then there was, we were going to maybe play at a neutral site, maybe play two matches in Berlin. Uh, because last year, when we played St. Petersburg, and we weren't able to, because of COVID things, we played two matches in St. Petersburg. Wow. So we thought we might have played two matches in Berlin, but the CEV decided, no, one match, winner take all. We can't hold up the rest of the competition. You're going to play one match in Berlin and that's going to, the, the winner will, will advance. Wow. And we were up 24, 20 in the first set and then blew that lead. No but way. Ha had the mental toughness to respond in the second and the third. Osmani, Juan Torreira pretty much took over in the fourth set. And then we won it, pushed through at home and won in the fifth. So wow. Big, uh, what was the fifth just set? Just coming like? off of that. Uh, we, Got a couple of big breaks early and then kind of wrote it. Uh, I think it was 15 8 or something by the end of it. But uh, we just served on a pretty, pretty sweet level and just we're happy that we, especially after the group, you know, we to get through Hulk Bank, Ankara, and Namir, and then also Xavierce and a good Bulgarian team. I think a lot of people thought we wouldn't make it through and now we're standing in the top eight of Europe. Yeah, so we're, we're stoked. Yeah. That's super sick. And who do you got next? Perugia. So Perugia, March, home and away. Start, wow. I think, yeah, March 3rd. So always <laughs> that's big. Yeah, that's so sick because, I mean, that's the best part about getting to play Champions League is it also shows you that, like, anyone can win. And that's no discredit to the, your team in Berlin. You guys have a pretty sick team. But it just goes to show, like, you know, any team can win at, at like high, in, like, high-level volleyball. You know, you have teams like Perugia, which – That'll be quite a, an interesting battle for you guys for sure because they're just on a roll. Um, yeah. But it's it'll be like I just always think that that's like the coolest part of Champions League is you can you just see so many um, ups, upsets or rather so many like good teams that don't make it. You know, there's a lot of really good teams that aren't in the top eight. You know, and you guys are totally. I think that's been a thing that surprised me even as a younger player is the level of volleyball on any given play or two is it can be. It's very, uh, across the world, you can find players that can do volleyball for one or two or three plays at a Champions League level. But, you know, can you do it? How often can you do it? How consistently? Um, you know, that seems that's, to be really, yeah. All right, that's, that's the whole thing. That's the right? <laughs> Dude, that's the best part about, like, Champions League to me is, like, you don't, you don't have to do it consistently. You got to do it for one, maybe two nights, you know? Yeah. Like, that's, I mean, again, like, not to discredit any, like, uh, 
what it takes to like make it far in champions league it's a huge honor and like it's so sick to get to battle against good teams and i think that brings out the best in everyone too battling against these teams that aren't in your league and like it's so there's something extra about it that's really cool um but yeah that's that's uh that's so sick dude yeah no different challenges for sure i know the the depth of the polish league is so strong this year for example you guys every night in night out um it's different but it's the reason i'm in berlin is these big these big matches to look forward to to train for you know against the best in the world and um and the german league is getting stronger too i know people have been kind of dogging it for years but i think you're seeing um well friedrichshafen also is is in standing in the top eight as well and and Dern and Lunenberg are really steady. Giesen as well. So it's, uh, yeah. Do you guys feel like you have an added advantage of, um, you know, when you play teams like Xavier Chair, when you play teams like Hawkbonk or someone that maybe they feel like, ah, it's a German league team. Like we should, we should come, we should, we're expected to win. And that in some ways you guys have this like, competitive edge do you feel that way or or i guess berlin is maybe a little different because berlin is such like a historical club but i would say winning is its own habit and skill for a team in some ways so i think if you're building that wherever you are you have a little bit of edge maybe coming into a single match or two so um there's i there's just a feeling a vibe on a team when you're winning and you're rolling and you have rhythm and um, I think that's an edge for us sometimes going into, but we also have to make sure we're winning those matches in the mm. German league. That's it's not always easy. So uh, I, I think it comes from that. I, I was talking to Santiago Danani about that a bit from years past, and you maybe have a good team in Italy, but if you're sixth or seventh or eighth and you're not winning and the level of the play is really good, but you're never getting this kind of like confirmation of winning some matches and, I think that can be also difficult mentally to get through a long season where you're not getting any of those, um, any of those big wins or any of that momentum. I also think it's important for younger kids. Uh, Kent Steffi is, is the beach volleyball player is posting this stuff on Facebook a lot. But one of the things he said is uh, kids need to experience some winning or some success when they're younger. And I would agree. I think it adds to the fun and the joy. And this, of course you can, get better by being on a bad losing team. I did that for so many years. I mean, my first championship was in Berlin for any sports championship. So Mm. for sure you can do it in other ways, but there's a certain feeling that comes when you're rolling like that. You said you, you said Berlin was your first championship and you've played overseas for like how long now? Eight years, eight years, eight years, eight years. And so like when you say it was your first winning team, was it like uh, also in high school or in club? I've just been on so many underdog teams my whole life. Yeah. I also in, in high school, I played Colorado boys volleyball, which was uh, not even sanctioned, you know? So I think I, I think sometimes a little bit, my journey gets misunderstood because um, I do have, sometimes people see me, Oh, Cody Kessel, Princeton. Um, I had to grind through so many of these underdog seasons. So uh, underdog and under you know not a lot of opportunities in high school got good on the beach and the grass just grinding through these road dog summers on the beach and the grass uh princeton we were always underdogs you know we snapped a 35 match losing streak to penn state while i was there we were the you know, the first time we were in the top 15 and kind of changed the culture at a program there and then also when i went overseas to play a year in switzerland and three years in lunenburg i was never on a top team and it wasn't yeah. until I got to Berlin so I kind of finally got to experience that and that and, and then chance to play for titles so yeah I mean you just covered so many things there so um, <laughs> no it's totally fine I yeah I would love I would love to hear a little bit about just your your youth um and yeah you make it sound like you've always been you've always been a loser you know, <laughs> and I empathize with that. I also was on a lot of losing teams. Um, but I'm kind of curious, like, what was it like, you know, growing up, especially with like, also with like a dad who was so involved in the sports program with Team USA. And like, so when you talk about like, I was always on a losing program, it's like, how you had a dad who was like, who knew how to how to build and, and make create a winner. <laughs> Is it just was it because of let's say, like, 
there wasn't a ton, ton of opportunity, for example, on like a, uh, like a U.S. stage, you know, to like compete at JOs and win or like, where, what do you mean by that exactly? Yeah, my childhood from a volleyball standpoint, I mean, um, yeah, my, my parents were divorced when I was young and I, when I was with my dad, my sister and I were with my dad, we were in the volleyball gym. There were, he, he was, he would be traveling the world or the United States doing various clinics. And we were just those gym rat kids that were always around the sport doing, um, whether it was a coaching clinic, you know, sometimes he'd be speaking to 50 or hundred coaches, or sometimes he'd be doing a, a summer camp type thing with, you know, three, 400 girls. It's kind of the main coach for that. And uh, so, and then I grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which was the, where the Olympic training center is and where the national teams trained for so many years. So yeah. my house was 10 minutes away. And so I had this early exposure to these great players, these great uh, teams seeing clay stanley a young reed pretty uh you know i put in the book that you know logan tom was my would come and babysit me in her spare time you know imagine a little like a just a kid who lives in anaheim whose dad would take him to the gym occasionally like that was mm -hmm. me and uh and i didn't start i played a lot of grass volleyball in the summers but i um, didn't didn't focus only on volleyball till i was 17. So that was kind of a pretty late start. And that, that also was a really late recruiting start for me. So I ended up taking a gap year after high school. Um, and I, is that just because, I, yeah. is that just because you played like, I know you played like lacrosse and you played a bunch of sports, like you were kind of an all around athlete. Yeah, I had a, a lot of exposure to a bunch of different sports growing up and was lucky for that. You know, also growing up in Colorado, people are super outdoorsy, skiing, camping, just getting Did outside a lot with friends. Skier, yeah. snowboard or anything? Yeah. Skier, are you pretty sick skier. on skis? No, nah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I haven't been in a long time, uh, but it's, it's always was so fun. Are you, do you bored? Dude. Oh my gosh. I freaking wish sure? I did not, oh. I did not snowboard that much at all. I really wish I did. Um, and I regret not doing it more often. Like how close were you to the mountain? Like, to uh, go it takes, ski, yeah, snowboarding. 90 minutes, two hours. Okay. I so was kind like of in a, a similar yeah, yeah, yeah. I was in a similar boat. I don't know why when I assume Colorado Springs, I assume they're just mountains are springing up all around. You, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, Maybe totally. Okay. No, totally. It's, yeah. it's, it's a little bit out of the way. As you know, it's a, it was a city of 500,000. So I, I went to like a, huh. the downtown inner city high school type thing. It was yeah. not like hardcore inner city, but it was still still a city. And well, dude, so what, kind of kid, what kind of kid were you? I'm I was so a total interested. nerd. I was an yeah? ultra uber nerd, super into school. And then, you know, just would do sports on the side, uh, worked really hard in school. Um, I go into that a bit in the book is um, I actually became a video game professional before I was a volleyball That's right. professional. Call of Duty? Was it Call of Duty? The Call of Duty. I was wow. so, I was that kid wow. with the Turtle Beach headphones. I would sneak out. I, I remember when it was a Christmas or a birthday that I got the Turtle Beach <laughs> headphones and the only thing that did is that meant that I could sneak out at like 11 or 12 in, the, in at night and still play without waking up my family. Wait, what are Turtle Beach headphones? They're like, they were like the really legit uh, noise canceling headphones at the time that the gamers wore. You know, when I, I got a pair, that was like the legit, legit thing that you did. Wait, you, you could said hear you the could... people, you could hear the footsteps better. You could hear all the sounds of the game better. Yeah, and yeah. Edge. Yeah, yeah, but it didn't, it, it's not like a freaking astronaut helmet that like, then when you <laughs> talked, like your dad couldn't hear you in the room next door, right? You know, yeah, like it was like that. I mean, I couldn't talk, but the, the full game could be on full blast in my he head and Got no it. one in the Got house it. would hear it. Got it. So nice. I just would get, you know, like, I think you've said, Dude, how? Just get this how? really addictive, really addictive personality. And this yeah. was, this was it for, you know, a year or two. Um, I mean, but how? So like, I'm guessing like most kids, you just like, your friends are playing video games, you start playing video games, and then Cody just has to take it to like level mock 10. <laughs> totally. Yeah, we, we, we had a clan, we would show up and there was this thing called game battles. And it was an internet, you it was like an internet forum where you would match with teams from around the world and then and then invite them to play a game. And it would be with like correct settings. And then there'd be a winner and a loser and you would both report it. And you would need a capture card to film the game in case any funny business happened. But then it was just wow. an honor system where you would report. And then you had world, you had US and global rankings of these clans. And 
we played a game against a top clan and I had a really good performance and they were like, Hey, you, you want to play for our clan? And there was no like, oh, way. Yeah. Yeah. It was fuck, like this. Bro? And, um, and then I had best friends, you know, that I'd never met in real life. There were these two kids in Florida and we would play this game type search and destroy, you know, was our four on four search and destroy was our bread and butter. Oh, yeah. And I would be drawing pre pre fire routes in class. I had all the strategy going and I was just super competitive and loved the, love that moment where like it was one on two and there's 30 seconds left and you got to defuse the ball, all that stuff. I just loved it. And uh, <laughs> <MacGruber! Sick. laughs> so yeah, Dude, I was a total so you, nerd. Yeah. You just sound, you sound like someone who is just like obsessed. Like if you found something you loved, you just obsessed over it. I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's clearly, clearly it seems like you had that for volleyball and you had that for call of duty. Um, do you feel like, uh, like, where do you feel like that was like such a benefit to you and your success? And where do you feel like maybe it was like a downfall for you? Yeah, I'm certainly glad I didn't continue it in depth. Um, I mean, I don't know, because, dude. Now it's like, you, yeah. could be make, you could be a millionaire you could be Call doing of Duty both. player, I should dude. be doing both. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? Open a Twitch channel. No, it's, For those uh, of you who want to see Cody open a Twitch channel, comment below. <laughs> we want to hear it. It would, yeah a little bit washed up now but i i think the really competitive deep focus is something that helped me and when we talk about elite level mental performance um you know so many players can do the skills as we talked about before kind of with these matches the differentiator at our level is really a lot of the time is the mental side and if you ask most athletes oh what percent of the game is mental most people are going to say more than half. Some people say 70, 80, some guys, 90% of the game is mental. Okay. Well, the point is it's a lot. And so the next question is kind of, how are you approaching that side of things? And we can talk about flow and all those things, but there's this competitive level of deep focus that's required just in the moment from whatever you're doing, you know, how well can you focus on the what's right in front of you and we talk about that in the national team gym or elite performers talk about that in a lot of different ways but how can you stay there over the course of a whole match over the course of a whole season how well do you manage the ebbs and flows of your focus and i think reed would was the first one who kind of talked to me about deep focus reed pretty was saying you know how well can you when that when that ball gets tossed in the air with the server how deeply are you really dialed in on that um so I think, I think that did transfer in some ways to my volleyball game, but you can also get that just from practice every day on the court. So, I mean, I mean, also just like you as a person, you know, like I, and you and I have talked about this before and I I've given plenty of examples on this podcast, on, at least for me, like how my obsession and I call it more of like an addictive personality, how it was like a good thing for me. And also like a bad thing that now, not a bad thing, but like a part of me that now I, um, I've had to alter so many different habits to combat the kid that I was in some way, you know, and learning more about yourself. And that's what I'm really interested in is like, because we, I also do want to get into a ton of Cody wrote a book. I want to get into so much of that. And we're going to get into that. Yeah. I'm just really, I'm really, I'm really interested also in like, just you as the person, your own like development as someone I'm always interested, at least when I meet someone else who has that kind of like obsessive not compulsive, yeah. but like, you know, like, like really obsesses over something they love. And you said you're writing like routes, like in class and stuff like that was me. If I love something, it's like, that's all I could think about. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of it cause I'm wearing this shirt. Um, uh, this is Dalton Ammerman's highs and lows. And they're talking about ment uh, giving back to mental health. And um, uh, when you get obsessed like that, you're, I think so often times your identity then lies in that thing. And I think a lot of young athletes and I was that young athlete where my, not only my performance, but my identity felt like it was rising and falling with every match, every swing, every stat line, I would go and check the stats after the game. And, you know, my whole mood and demeanor would shift based on what I was seeing, you know, is it, 0.200 or 0.400 and that would be a huge difference on how I felt about myself as a human being 
So mm. I think getting some separation there is a and dude, is... just to be clear, a lot of people do that. And I, I was yeah. who's I just I was just talking with Eric. I had Eric on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and like I was just talking with him about the same thing where it's like it's dude, it's hard not to check your stats. And I get it for like, you know, when I was in club, when you're in club, you're not checking your stats, you know, you don't really care so much. But then like when you start playing and now it's your living, and now it's like, yeah. you know, for players like you and I, I put myself in that same kind of like underdog category. It's like, dude, I need those stats to be like, hey, look what I did. Like, here's my resume, you know, like you need some of that. And it's hard. You you bring up, I would love, I just find it yeah. fascinating that you you also equate it to like how you felt about yourself as a human being, you know? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I know that, that grind and that desire and there's nothing wrong with, hey, I want to um, get that. And I still struggle with that because we have to go all in. I think people don't realize when we choose this lifestyle, it's, it's, it takes, it can take over everything. It's, it's so hard on our relationships. You know, it's uh, our free time, our, it's, it's not, it's like joining the military. I mean, you're over here, the club owns your time more or less. You give that to them and then you are giving mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, you know, energy every day into, into this. And so, of course, you're going to be really tied into it and say, hey, this means so much. But just if we can get a little bit of separation there, it was just been so help, helpful for, for, for my journey. It's, you know, this person, this idea of being the person over the player. So there was a really good video that I watched that was talking about a younger player At the end of the day, people are gonna people are gonna forget your stats, even your championships. I mean, who won the Polish Plus League three years Dude, ago? Isn't that just like you um, have it's no honestly idea? It's honestly almost such a beautiful thing to remember if you can remember. I mean, dude, I've said I said this before too. It's like when I left Hawaii, and I'm sure you felt the same way at Princeton. It's like we had the best record, or like we made it for us, like we made it into the NCAA uh playoffs for the first time in like a decade or something and like we had such a good team we were number one in the nation and i was just like you just you're on top of the world and then yeah. one year go by two year goes by and now i've been playing professionally for eight years none of those kids know who i am dude. <laughs> like maybe some person might remember me because i keep kind of the same hair situation going on whatever but like dude no one remembers you and it's almost like yeah. like why can't our brain just remember that you know like throughout our daily life like why is it totally. so hard to remember that like hey like in a in 10 years from now you're i don't even know how much you're gonna like remember your volleyball journey it'll be it'll feel like, like such a past life to you you know yeah like that should be so comforting and yet it's so hard to keep in mind in our daily lives i feel like a hundred percent and that's a reason i even felt like i wrote i wanted to write the book i was like i did all these amazing cool things and i I feel like I'm losing them. I need to like show them and capture them. So I feel that so much, but people do remember how you make them feel. You know, people remember your personality, the things that you did uh, in their community or what you meant to them. Hmm. And the more that we can get in touch with that, um, you know, the kids are gonna forget the, the stat lines and the championships, but they, you know, if you were, if you were their coach or you helped them with something, or those are the things that are going to get remembered long-term. Mm -hmm. And if, if you can bring that kind of like what the world needs type of stuff more into your, you know, there's these, <sighs> the more that you can bring that into your, what you're doing, I think it just, it's just helped me a lot. I know I didn't really say anything there. No, dude, it, I think it's, well, here, here's what I, when I hear that, I, I think of like, I also, I feel like um, there's always like that type of person. There's always that player. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, and you actually might be that player. But for <laughs> me, I've like, I've always had that player on my team who just seems to show up regardless of their circumstances in life, regardless of what they do, show up and give a hundred percent and just like have a good time doing it. I had that with a guy named uh, Davis Holt and an at at UH. And right now this guy, Shane, this Polish dude I play with, he's about to have a kid. He has his own job on the side because he's our fourth middle and makes like no money. So he has his, a shoe business on the side. He works like he barely sleeps. Dude, the guy in, Polish people in general, we all know are machines. They're not human beings. They're robots that are crafted in uh, <laughs> factories. But uh, like this guy is such a machine. And every time I think about wanting to complain or whatever, I just look at him like, how could I? 
The guy's like about to have a kid. He's got a, a full-time job on top of his full-time volleyball job that he gets paid almost nothing. And he shows up and every day he's like, I'm gonna fuck you up. I'm gonna eat you. I'm like, and totally. he's jacked and just like, but I'm just, it, it inspires me, you know? And it's like, those, to your point, I completely agree with you. It's like 10 years from now, I'm gonna remember him. 10 years from now, he's gonna be my example when I explain to someone else what it means to be like that hardworking person because he'll forever live in my mind as that example. And I've had that on a lot of teams that I've been on. Um, and I, I find it to be like, to your point, it's like, it's one of the most beautiful things you can, you can leave behind for someone else, you know? Yeah, totally. And there's a sports psychologist, Dr. Jim Lohr, who does a great work on this. He calls it the hidden scorecard. And he says that a lot of times we're judging ourselves on this hidden scorecard, which is our treatment of others and how we're showing up in our daily lives and living our values. And, and we can, when we can get alignment on those things and we can find out what we truly value, what you know, and what you're doing with the podcast, what we're doing with, do, you know, doing our best to share our journeys to younger versions of ourselves. Um, those things can bring so much into, into that journey in the way, you know, the way we're going through life. And um, yeah, I just think it's, it's, it's so important to talk about even at, when they see players at this, or I, you know, at the levels we've reached, it's like, you guys, this, this is, uh, these are the things that stick with you. So a lot of the times these relationships, these, and the way that you treat others. And, and, and then it will also empower high performance when you get in touch with that stuff and figure it out what it means for you. Well, uh, speaking of sharing your journey, you did write a book and guess what? I do want to talk about it. it. And I know like you, you as a person, also your story is really interesting and fascinating. Um, and on, on top of that, to me, it was just, I, I was like, I have to have Cody on here. Cause I don't know any other players who have written a book. And I, dude, I remember writing like years ago that like my, my goal was to write a book before 30. And obviously I didn't do that. It's not, <laughs> we're finding a new voice, whatever. Um, but I just think it's like, it's such an amazing thing that someone, a professional athlete has finally written a book in the volleyball community. I think it's literally the coolest thing. Um, and I just first off the bat, like want to just like give you some love. Like I, I, I thank you so much for, for doing this. And so does hopefully the volleyball community. And, um, hopefully a lot of people get to read it. I hope this helps as well promote it because I, I wanted to do everything in my power to be like, yo, let's like, let's let people know. Cause this is sick because what I think people don't realize is it's so easy for, you think about like, I don't know, like a LeBron James or like what, someone who's in the NBA, they're making millions. Why write a book? Yeah. Like, and it's like, what's, why not just spend your time playing Call of Duty and starting a Twitch account and just like, you know, like why? <laughs> and I think that's the thing that I think is so beautiful almost about our sport is like, you know, unless you're the 0.1% who's making like insane money where it's like, just chill. And guess what? A lot of those guys from a mental standpoint are not that happy. Um, right. and, it, and they're not that fulfilled because eventually volleyball feels like a job, you know? <laughs> and, and I just think it's so cool that like, like people don't understand also how difficult it must be to take the extra time that you have where you're exhausted a lot of the time and like you've trained and maybe it was a good training. Maybe it was bad. Maybe you had an injury, like so many different things affect so, from a psychological standpoint, like how you come home and view your free time, let's say. Um, but I, before we get like too deep into that, I want to know, like, first, like what inspired you to want to write a book? Well, thank you. First of all, it means a lot. I really appreciate it. I, I feel the same, what you're doing with the knock podcast it off. and all these no, creative knock it no, off. Truly, what truly, no, truly. So what inspired me to write the book? Um, I think also this feeling of wanting to capture this journey and these things. I think, I think there was part of it that, okay, I finally made it one of my big goals of playing with the senior national team this summer. You know, I made my first VNL start and I ended up traveling with the team for world championships. There was this, I think there was a little bit of extra stamp of approval or that my journey, something extra that, oh, my journey, not that my journey was any more valid, but it seemed like that was a, it was a pretty inspirational moment to go and do that and, and live those moments. And and I wanted to capture them for, for anyone else and also for myself. Um, and then I've written a blog and a newsletter for, I don't know, seven or eight years. It's been my thing on the side. And I also wrote a senior thesis at Princeton. I was a history major. And so we did a lot of reading and writing. And I wrote, you know, 60, 70 pages. It was like a, basically like a small book. And I really enjoyed that. 
And I wanted to write a bunch of letters to my younger self and also just capture all these things that meant so much to me over, you know, eight years overseas, four years through Princeton. I had, how do you, what do you walk away with? And I just wanted to capture more of those feelings and, and hope that they can reach other players and help them with the similar struggles that I had and help make it easier for them too, hopefully. So there's so many things. Um, and as I was going through the book, I was just overcome with gratitude for all there were so many ways along the path where I shouldn't be here today there's so many things that could have gone a different way and when you when I was going back through my journey I was thinking of all the injuries all the roadblocks all the coaches that helped me all the little different things and just just overwhelmed with gratitude and joy and this positive energy from but look here I am I'm still going I'm 31 I've achieved a lot of these things that a little Cody Kessel would just be losing his mind about. And when I stay in touch with that inner child, that's also when I'm continue to play my best volleyball. So mm. I know that was a lot of answers, but it's a bunch of those things kind of tied into one. No. Yeah. I can imagine. Uh, yeah. I can imagine there's something and dude, I like, maybe it's the same feeling for you, but I feel so similarly um, with like creating the Academy and working with kids one-on-one -on -one and the podcast. And it's like, it does re it gets me back in touch with the younger generation. And really what that means for me is a younger version of me. And it gets, it, it is such a great reminder, especially at our age, I'm 30. Well, I'll be 31 in a couple of weeks. You're 31. Like it, it's such a great reminder of like, Oh yeah, I love this thing because there's so yeah. many days where, um, I don't for me at least there's so many days where it feels like it can feel just like a job, you know, certainly. Yeah. And gra granted, like, I think just playing volleyball, I've always called it like, it's like my church, you know, like in those normally for that hour and a half, it's like, I'm thinking about nothing, but like whatever I'm doing, even if it's, I'm upset with something, whatever, at least I'm focusing on what I'm doing. It's the outside yeah. of volleyball that can become a little more difficult to deal with as you get older, I feel like. Um, but I, you're, you're right. I feel like it, it absolutely, uh, I could imagine like completely reignited a flame for you. And do you feel like it's given you this, uh, you said sense of gratitude, but almost like this fire to want to continue. Um, I totally. Mean, I know. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, totally. Um, it's yeah. And what you just said, I, you're saying, Hey, it's your church and you're able to focus on just right. What you have in front of you. I mean, that's also a key reason why you're such an elite player and you made it to the levels you have is, you know, this, when I step inside this area, this is, this is what I can just be completely immersed and completely lost in. And um, yeah. Uh, but for me, sorry, your question was. No, it wasn't. A, I don't even remember if it was a question. Honestly. <laughs> this is remember. less of an interview. It's more, this I don't know. Is just, a chat. Just, that's literally all this is. I'm just brainstorming. I don't know. I just was, I was so fascinated by I am the older I get, the more fascinated with like, how much can I get in touch with that? Like getting in touch, not just with like the younger generation. Like, for example, we have this kid, Jaden Russell, I think his name is, um, yeah. who's like going to be a UCLA recruit. He's here right now in Olsen training for like two months. He's not practicing every day with, with, uh, with our team, but like he's showing up in the gym and, and he's from the States as well. And he's doing like, he took a gap year and like, he's just oh, traveling, cool. whatever. And so Javier is helping him out with John and they're like, Anyways, yeah. uh, the point the point of saying that is like he's 19, and dude, when I have conversations with him, it's like, and I'm the only other American here now. Yeah, it's like, dude, he just seems like such a boy, and yeah. I'm just like, I'm like, dude, that was me, bro. Just like yeah. he's so full of like so excited to be here in Poland. Meanwhile, I'm like, get me out of here, dude. <laughs> you know? No, but like, you know, it's like it, that energy it brings. It's like it's like such a reminder of like, dude, Taylor, like that used to be you, bro. Like, like that energy and some days it is, you know, but like, I think getting, having resources or having something in your environment to give you that type of energy in whatever you want to do. It's the same with like, I don't know if you have that teammate who's just like always showing up and working hard and good sense of humor and like, no matter what, it's like, that's the environment that like, it'll bring that out of you more often than not as compared to, for example, like I've been on teams where specifically in France one year where it was like, it was like, let this is our job. We don't like the coach. We complain about him a ton. Like we bitch about how much we don't like him. And then you get in the locker room and guys are bitching. And it's just like, now they don't like the practice. And so everyone just treats it like a job. And then it's like, what am I doing here? 
You know, when like when you're young, it's like any opportunity you get to play is like, I'm down. Like this guy's yeah. training with a, a pro team and he's so stoked, like so stoked, you know? And I I think there's something really special to that. And in, in fact, I think getting a chance to do something like for you, write this book that like kind of makes you think about your journey. I think it's such an important part that I wish, uh, I, I feel like a lot of high level athletes could really benefit from, or, or especially for those maybe pro athletes now who are struggling, just like taking the time to remember, like, dude, remember how far you've come. And now for you, you got a book yeah. <laughs> that you can look back on and like, you got plenty of memories there, you know? A hundred percent. And just the simple reminder of uh, this is probably a pretty negative way of saying it, but there were so there's so many guys that would kill to be where I am now. And I just, mm. even remembering guy, the, a bunch of teammates or um, friends that this path didn't work out for, and it's still working out for me, you know, of course, thanks to, of course, thanks to a huge amount of hard work and passion and grit and grind and all these things, but, there were also a bunch of breaks along the way. And so I think, and everyone has these stories. Everyone, everyone has a books. When I think of my team, my, my, you know, we got 13 players on VR volleys right now. Everyone has a book inside them of how they got onto the court. Mm. So I think as a fan or a fellow player or a spectator too, you can remember that when you're watching six on six out on the court, that's, you have 12, 14 incredible stories of how guys have gotten to where they are in their careers. And uh, that's another thing that I just like staying in touch with is, you know, we're all on this, we're all on the same thing. We're all on the same journey and not the same journey, but look I at mean, this amazing sport. We are in sport. terms of the human experience, this, yeah, dude. Totally. Yeah, and look for at this sure. amazing sport we share and the more that we can connect with others and, you know, it's just, it's just all good stuff. So I feel like this brings me into, I want to get a little bit into some of the stuff in your book and you talk about, yeah. I think it's from the first chapter. You talk about like choosing joy and describe it as being a choice and, I think it's, it relates so well to what you just said, this idea of like, uh, or at least it made me think about how quick people are even to like, to judge, you know, where it's just like, oh, that guy sucks, or he's playing like shit or something. And to your point, it's like, damn, dude, everyone has their story. You know, why is, why is it that it feels like, uh, and maybe this is, uh, I guess the part I was more, more wanted to relate this to was like, since joy is a choice, why do you think that it's so hard for most of us on our daily lives and experience in volleyball to choose joy? Life is suffering, man. It's just tough. It's not, it's not, you know, I think, I think a lot of times people see me and they all, you know, you're just this, this kind of like sunshine and you're just choosing joy. It's like, that's not me all the time. But, mm -hmm. but when I do it a bit more, then a bunch of things can change. Even if I had two, three, four, five percent more. Uh, during during the COVID times, I took a there's like a Yale a free course online about studying happiness. Um, it's offered by for free. You guys should go check it out if you have the time to do it. And I, it's choices like that where I made this happiness a priority it's like something where again where you can get you can get obsessed about it you can study it you can learn about it you can see what's going on under the hood and can choose, I ask you a like, question really quick? choose that you care about it and then build it more into your life yeah for sure no my thought is you you said like you decided to take this course on happiness my thought is like if you already feel like so happy and full of joy like why take the course so it makes I, me think I like what... sorry i so this is like when COVID no, 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 was happening no. that's, and that's and everyone... what i'm trying to yeah yeah yeah, oof. yeah i would just like i want to I mean, know your struggles you know like speaking of the relation yeah totally speaking of yeah. the how it's hard on relationships is i had just broken up with a long-term girlfriend of mine we were together for five years she had mm. supported me through a bunch of seasons we had been you know since princeton we were together and it didn't it wasn't going to work out and then we split and then a few weeks later, COVID hit, you know, and you're back with your family and everyone's world more or less in different ways was upended, you know, us for more than us, more than others. Cause we we're just kind of plucked out from where we were and then scattered back to wherever we came from. And it was an amazing time with my family, but I wasn't in a good spot, you know, just like struggles of my first season in Switzerland where I got injured. I played bad, mediocre. My first season, mm -hmm. I thought I'd never play again everyone has these you know kind of more more or less rock bottom moments in their life and um i tried to turn again to like hey i 
I have a choice here, you know, and this is, it's thanks to my upbringing. I think, I think my dad was the one to teach me, you know, this, this pretty dark moment in human history. There's this, you know, man's search for meaning is this book that a lot of people reference, but for me, Mm. it's been so powerful (laughs) because this guy went through the Holocaust. He lived through the darkest, most difficult situations in human history, one of them. And he basically in his book reminds us that even in those moments, there were still people giving away their last bit of bread. And you see that in the beautiful human experience. We always have this choice. And we think we don't. We think we have to give in to the suffering. And of course, on so many days I do that. I'm not, uh, but but we have a choice. You are the magic. You need to decide. You have consciousness. Like this is the amazing thing. And we need to hold on to that idea. Yeah, I, it's, it's always, I'm always, this is why personally I'm so fascinated with like, these concepts is sometimes it seems like it's actually not difficult like sometimes the 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 magic in life is actually really simple you know like it's not but but yet i think we make it we make it feel like so unattainable in our own minds you know and this thought process of like you know the the ability to choose joy in a situation it's like, I don't know, it's almost sounds like cringy to me where it's like, it, it seems cring- just like, oh yeah, you're gonna, cringy. you're gonna choose joy. Like it sounds sure. super cringy and you get this <laughs> initial, like, screw you. Like, like I'm not going to, but <laughs> it totally, I, I have that gut reaction too. And yeah. you know, it put, it, but it puts people off, Yeah. but you, you know, you just want to remind like, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's a fight. It's a, like, for me, it's a forceful fight and choice that you have to make all the time. And I know it's not, it's, it's ridiculously difficult, but even like that little kid of, oh, oh, I, I'm, you know, look at, yeah, it's, oh, this so cliche. Oh, smell the roses. The, it's the little things, it's the little things, the little joys, you know, people are like, ah, shut up, but it's, it's there. It's true. So my, my question is like, say there's someone out there who's like, oh man, I, I want to live a life that's more fulfilling. I want to live a life that's more joyful. <laughs> like where, where can they begin to apply that concept into their life? Like, what does that actually look like when you begin to apply it? I, so I think of so many things uh, that, I, that I lean again into the learning and the research that's been done on it. Um, there's, there's a little, there's a just, it's a combination of a hundred little things. So I try to share a bunch. So one that pops into mind, there's a Tony Robbins quote that says, when you're suffering, you're focused on yourself or you're focused on me. And you kind of have an over, you know, every, it's like an over ego thing. And so how do you just do a, of course, it's the cliche thing, do something for someone else, show some gratitude, like get out of your own head because you're, when you're suffering, a lot of times you're just so stuck in your own experience. Um, so that's one thing we know that gratitude is is tied in with that just the way that the the human brain works we kind of covered a bunch of those things and it's just having 20 30 40 different strategies and it's not always like oh um you also need to feel these negative emotions you know i talk about that in the book a bit or i try to it's it's not like oh just push those things away all the time you have to create space Mm -hmm. for feeling the complete human experience letting that pass through you working through it in whatever way you need to work through it and then go oh i'm back to the place where i have a choice and, and yeah no i just want i want to see if it's if you're if we can give like an example you know like give, give me an example of like a, a practice or a game or something because you do talk about that this idea of like negative emotions and not just to suppress them to learn to sit with them um and almost learning learning how to tap into your negative emotions or your the, the yeah, dark side you, can. you know for sure for sure yeah. you can you know everyone i think or a lot of athletes you maybe have had that where you see red or you just there's no whatever emotion has got you just so pissed off or upset you stop thinking and then you end up playing amazing because you're just acting in the moment as you are experiencing it right now mm. um yeah an example of just how you how you're responding to you know these look what i what i gathered a lot from your book too is is just this concept that we internally have the choice to respond regardless of our external environment and so it's almost this like stoic concept of like non-attachment a little bit um and i am was just interested in in like how a listener could Totally. You can give a practical example. So like, you know, 
like give an exit can you give an example like either in a game yeah. or in a practice what, I think what the is classic that like? one the classic one in a game is the referee for me so hmm. if a referee makes a terrible call I, I would say 70 to 80 percent of players just lose it on the referee and they're like how could you possibly have seen this situation in this horrible way that you did they have all these extra emotions judgments emotions fears whatever that come up with it the captain goes over to talk. The coach makes a big show of it. And I, part of that is because I have a lot of referee friends growing up where I've seen how they're a partner in our sport. That's very important to continuing our sport. But I realize and I know that I don't control them, that I don't have control over how the referee is going to, you know, the referees do a lot of, they do training. They do a lot of training. They maybe are not in the gym every single day like we are. So they're not going to get everything right all the time. You know, there's 250 points, 200 points in a volleyball batch. They may, they're almost every time they're going to get a few wrong. And a lot of people lose their heads or expect like another point to come back to them or they get caught up in these extra stories. And an edge for me is that, of course, I have discussions with referees from time to time, especially I really disagree. But I think I'm able to move on to the next play and back to a calm present state better than other players and then mm -hmm. able to to use that and that's like the competitive side of me is like because i think getting back to that calm present moment is fine there are other players that maybe feed off of that i've seen i've seen was, leaders i've seen leaders get red cards on purpose to get their team fired up so mm -hmm. everyone's gonna i think it goes there's different ways to go about it for sure yeah, that reminds me of a game we actually, out of, when you were saying that, it, I was laughing because I was like, wow, I have the almost like opposite, ex I had the opposite experience like three games ago. Javier, our coach, was like so pissed. I don't even remember what the call was and Javi's like freaking out at this ref, like just like, this is insane. Like it was like, a, what are you doing? Freaking out. And all of us are like, like what's going on? You know, everyone's freaking yeah. out. And I feel like internationally guys freak out. <laughs> so like especially in like the italian league also in poland like guys are just like it's so dramatic yeah. and excessive i love it honestly yeah um but i remember him getting so frustrated and me being like all right fuck this ref like i it's almost like and i've said this before where i feel like as i get older finding ways to grab external yeah. energy and bring it inside of me totally. is like such a strategy because like when i was younger like dude like this Jaden, like if i was 19 like I, I remember mine. I'm sure you remember your like first time stepping on the national team. Like, dude, you got the energy. The energy is there. You're not tired. You know, you're like, holy yeah. shit. It almost feels like you're dreaming, you know, like you have, and I remember my first games uh, as a professional in the, in the Italian league, like just like uh, so excited and stoked to like be playing and like energy was not the problem. And then as I get older, it's like, <clears throat> I'm like constantly looking for like, all right, yeah. it looks like we're getting a triple shot of espresso yeah. this morning. <laughs> like, and, you know. and, and you need to take that. I, I'm saying, especially yeah. for players, take that challenge, yeah. take that determination. Yeah. That feeling of proving other people wrong, to me, that's not a negative. To me, that's a challenge, yeah. internal, like, positive energy that you can totally take and use. And, and so I, take it. And take you brought it. up, <laughs> you brought up such, a, such an interesting point, too, this idea of, like, it, to me, at least it was like, figure out what works for you, you know, yeah. because you're right. Like I look at, and I've used players. One of the players I use as an example all the time is like a guy like Max Holt. Max Holt to me is always been someone I've looked up to like, dude, he never loses his cool. And he's never like way amped up. He's just fucking steady Eddie, baby. And Maddie, he just does Maddie his Maddie thing. And he, yeah. Maddie too, for sure. Great examples. And then I think about like, I'm like, Dude, I'm I've tried, so I'll never forget a season where I like started off the season like that's what I want to be. I want to be chill. I'm not gonna lose my mind if I bounce the ball. I'm not gonna lose my mind if I'm getting tooled a bunch on the block. Like I'm just gonna be chill. And I realized like I can't, dude. Yeah. I can't yeah. be that guy. And I am pretty mellow. I'm not like someone who definitely I'm definitely not someone who gets overexcited on the court personally, but like I need to at least internally, you talk about like choosing your internal environment like i had to have some bit of fuck you like i had to have this totally. like underdog mentality of like i'm just that small middle no one care i'm not going to get that big contract but i'm going to just like you know like i i had that like yeah. edge and i realized like oh that's my that's my superpower now if totally. you're gonna if you're gonna lean into the dark side the dark arts you know totally. you gotta make you gotta make sure that you can do it in a way that's not also harmful because for example, I just had a, one of the worst games I've had all season and I leaned so hard into it that then it was like, 
oh, I'm actually like, I, I can't believe this is happening to me. Like, I can't believe it. I suck, dude. Like, I, I can't believe this is ha- like, it made me turtle shell in that game. And I'll never, it was now looking back on it. It's like, I needed a game like that to just like, it had me deeply thinking about, you know, the game after and just like, what could I have done differently? And like, how can I respond different? And like, that's the nice part about getting older and becoming more self-aware. You're, you're able to really take the most from those uh, small lessons life has to give you, you know? Um, yeah. but I, yeah, um, I, I think it's interesting. So where do you, where do you find yourself on that scale of like, you know, you have this kind of like underdog mentality and maybe you have a little bit of like, you're a little in your mind, at least like you're ready to bark. And then at the same time, trying to get to that present kind of point for point, smooth mentality, like calm, cool, collected. Man. Great. So glad we're touching on all of this because I, haven't lost that and maybe I didn't touch up on that enough in the book of how that's a back it throughout my journey that's been a, a thing same thing as you this underdog mentality this chip on your shoulder I don't think you can lose that I think if you lose that it's you know but how can we have a healthier relationship and make sure that it maybe doesn't affect us and make us bad teammates or poison ourselves as people off the court you know this is mm. separate things where I'm saying you can really effectively when you like you were saying before earlier in the podcast when you step onto the court you kind of it's just your church it's just like a separate thing that you go and step in to do and then tailor off the court is there's some of that to that you know like you turn into the beast whatever it is that you kind of switch that personality on i think that's totally fine when i talk about the ref thing it's um the players that it's it's just being the awareness of hey here's what's going on and how can i use it to my advantage some guys are going to do it differently than others Mm -hmm. and for me i tend to lose my head i start seeing red if i get too into the referee or what he's going i lose my head and i've already like then i'm going to try to hit the ball next ball harder which you need this balance of like how can i take that energy and then use it so i really don't have an answer for you it depends on situation and you learn from it like everyone does for themselves no, my, but. i i would i really want to know like where do you find like forget about the like referee example just in general you as a, you as a player right now where do you and have you always been consistently like the same like actually we're mixing it up yeah, I, yeah. i'm really interested to know how you've evolved from like what was like a young cody's response to like who you are now and has that changed because i know for myself like i've been all over the place from like yeah. cocky kid to then super humbled and by being that humbled it almost made me like shy to then back into cocky to then like i had a season in france where it was like i was way too much looking to talk shit because i needed it i needed that energy i needed that feeling of like i'm in jail and the only way out of here is to like beat some ass you know like i need, <laughs> i needed that bro and and now yeah. as, as i've gotten older i've had all these pen i've had all these swings of emotions and now i'm slowly narrowing down like okay we can use this but let's not get too attached to it because we don't want it to bleed into who we are off the court like does that does that yeah. make sense like i'm interested in like your flow as a player totally yeah first thing i'll say is i don't i also think if we step out onto the court and we're already doing all this meta thinking about what we're taking and not like I think you've already lost the plot. You know, we have to sure, step on yeah. the board and go play. Second yes. thing is about my history is when I, at, at Princeton, for example, I was super nice, wanted to be everyone's friend, had a lot of people pleasing. Still to this day, it's something I struggle with. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of people pleasing in me. And I wanted everybody to like me almost all the time. Didn't matter if I beat them or I lost to them. I just wanted mm-hmm. to be liked. And that transferred onto the court. And um, Coach Schweisky was really helpful in like helping me cultivate and release this inner beast. So how you know the way that we went about doing that when I would have these flashes where I would get upset at him or something and drill a ball into a kid's face and he would like say, "Whoa, what just happened there? <laughs> how can you know?" I, what do you I, mean I, drill a ball into a kid's face? I remember Connor Duby. I just totally just we were doing this digging drill down the line and it was like this moment and you know Schweisky and Doobie will both attest to it I was getting so upset at what he was coaching me or what cue he was giving me he kept giving me over and over and over again and I just was so upset drilled the ball down the line it's one of the hardest hits of my life probably and I got I came back to like normal coding and was like oh hey like and, and coach was like whoa no what was that <laughs> <laughs> so 
for sure finding these different parts of yourself and you know not being ashamed of them um as i then i had to go into grinder mode i mean i was a even though i was a, a you know second team all-american out of princeton as an opposite my first year overseas in switzerland was really difficult moved to from opposite to outside hitter and our team was losing and i you know, it's my first year it's my job and i struggling and then i got i worked myself so hard i worked myself into an injury basically more or less and was out the rest of the season what uh, happened hey, well probably i uh really on like an inside out route after i hand passed in five uh just torqued my ankle and had tore all three ligaments and then had oh. bone bruising on my talus and was out four or five months and there was a chance, like there was a, maybe a chance I could come back and play, but I ended up just staying on as like, a, because I had the obsession and the passion still, I stayed on and did rehab, but then became a data volley assistant scout for my team. And, but at that point, again, had a mediocre season, wasn't, was kind of in between playing opposite and outside, didn't really show anything special, was this underdog outside, you know, from a, from Princeton, which is, you know, I'm the only player from Princeton to play more than one or two years overseas. You know, Pat Schreiber, Mike Dye did it. We have, we've had great players in the past, but mm. most guys just go get their eye banking thing or go on with their lives. And I still had this hunger and I, I, this team in Lunenburg took a chance on me and, you know, for nothing for a third outside hitter on a lower Bundesliga team. And it was another second lease on my whole career and my chance in my life there. So I just gave it everything. And that's where I, got to play a lot again, but also found this, you know, this fearlessness and this confidence that you have to build up slowly in a lot of ways and had great coaches, great teammates who let that happen there and uh, kind of got back to being the beastly outside that I needed to be in this new role. So you talk, you yeah. talk about, you talk about also getting clear on confidence. Um, and I think it's like chapter seven, you talk about it and yeah. Uh, you talk about this concept of, of, of self-talk and being grounded and like, even like writing things down. I'm really interested in like, what is your process to confidence or rather what things did you change in those years to then develop that type of confidence? Totally. I would love to dive into an example from that. So I, in Lunenburg, I remember I, the role on my team because of the way my career has developed has oftentimes been as a float server. And because I spent then so many years in that role for my team, it's now become a strength of mine, even at the highest levels. So I think that's another misunderstood thing about me. I was a jump server. I can still jump serve, but this float serve has turned out to be a really effective thing that's helping me. Anyway, back in Lunenburg, I had pretty negative thoughts about it. I was, didn't I hadn't accepted it I was like you know the classic like oh it's I'm just not a very good server or the technique's not so good it's soft it's it's not working so well or I it didn't feel like confident manly serve you know you can all these other yeah, things yeah. that come into it yeah and um we did an exercise where you write down some of these first you have to get vulnerable enough to write down for yourself what some of these thoughts are going through your head that are not helpful and when you get to that point then you can basically self-edit them you can go back in so if mine was you know i have a soft serve or something when that thought comes in my head you can do a series of like journaling exercises where all of a sudden the next time that thought comes up you go oh no i don't i actually have a very effective and and nasty float serve that helps my team I want to be you really clear about you can literally script this out to yourself. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I just want to be really clear about yeah, how how this works. So you're saying maybe there's a, a journaling exercise. And I don't know if you have either resources for where people might be able to like seek out if they're interested in in being more grounded by through journaling. Um, yeah. but for you it was <clears throat> let's write all the negative self-talk out look at it, review it and find ways to almost reframe it. Is that the exercise? Yeah, it was a bunch of steps where, you know, you go through your strengths, you go through your weaknesses. Uh, I'd have to ask Stefan Hubner for it, actually. So it was like a 12 step thing we did with the whole team. But in the course of the program, dude, it was okay. like a 12 step program. <laughs> but in the middle of that, there was there was a so I'm gonna have to dig this up and find it for for the podcast notes so we can throw it in there. But in the middle of that, there was I'd gotten to this point where okay, talk about our strength, talk about our weaknesses. 
And then I, I got to this point of being able to write down some of my negative self-talk and you see it on the paper and you go, this is ridiculous. Even, you know, or, um, I have had negative thoughts about, oh, my passing technique is not good enough for the highest levels of sport. And how do you work through this? Because these limiting beliefs and these limiting stories can derail entire careers. And mm -hmm. so if you really want to get under the hood and be, have the vulnerability and emotional strength to get into them and then change them and go, okay, I know that these thoughts keep coming up. I now that I've done journaling and I, I, I give my brain something else to feed on that I've written, that even if the, the thing on the chalkboard, right? Write it 20 times, 50 times in your notebook. You know, I have a nasty and effective float serve and the other team should be terrified when I am behind the line. Okay, that's a long one, but you can shorten it and then you can write that yeah. and it, become, it can become a mantra and it can become a sticky note on your phone where you see it a hundred times a day where that you know every time you see that little blue sticky note it means you know i'm an athletic receiver or i you know i have all everything i need inside of me already i need to succeed whatever the you know that can be so powerful if you're repeating those self, that's that kind of self-talk to yourself especially when you hey hey oh there's that negative fun little thought loop i have going on again and here it is again mm -hmm. showed up this time i have a toolbox to deal with it a little bit better and to help me move forward and I think that those strat like self self talk is obviously across all sports is just such an important subject. You mentioned the inner game of tennis, which is a great book also for people to check out. Um, that kind yeah. of goes through like the different self one and self two and different versions that we have of, of ourselves. And yeah, uh, I I find it to be like self talk is is so interesting. And to me, it's something I look at. I look at like the younger version of myself, right? And I think like younger version of myself, self-talk, like I wasn't interested in that. I was totally. having so much fun and like loving so much what I was doing. Like I wasn't even aware of it. So, right. It's like this first step is like being self-aware that like, oh yeah, sometimes I talk negatively to myself and understanding that like the story you tell yourself is through which you begin to see the world. And the truth is like, that's not the reality of the situation. And it, it is what it highlights for me is like the power that we have of our, in our own minds to, totally. to change those things. And that understanding too, for me, I think sometimes it's like, you know, when things are going great, I don't need to, I'm not going to write down my, I'm not going to journal like the negative things I say or like whatever. It's like, things are mostly going pretty good, but it's like, then you have that really bad game and you wish you would have stayed consistent, not just with writing down your negative self-talk, but with having a plan for when those days come up. And I feel like for myself, it's like either I wasn't aware of it when I was younger or what, but like, as I get older, I'm like so much more aware of like good days and bad days, ebbs and flows, you yeah. know, and the importance of that story we tell ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And for all the other listeners out there, again, it's totally normal to have these ebbs and flows. It's totally normal to have these thoughts. It's totally normal to have these whatever stories on are going on inside of your head. I, it wasn't until this exercise. I mean, I was 24, 25 when I was 26 or something when I did that exercise. Mm -hmm. This was a much later like jump in my career that I just happened to remember because it was so impactful for my self-talk and my self-story. And then therefore my self-confidence, because that's what I was saying to myself about myself. And you, you also in that chapter, you talk about like being grounded. Can you describe a little more of what you mean by like being grounded? Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, I mean, there's a great You're talking about quote. walking barefoot on the earth, dude? It, it didn't make it into the book, I don't think. But there was a quote by Micah where he said that, you know, I know where my identity lies and that's in Christ and no win or loss will ever define me. And I went, whoa. You know, Micah is one of the most consistently confident, incredible players and athletes that I've played with. And mm -hmm. he is so grounded in his faith in God and Christ. And I don't have that, you know, for yeah. we can get into that, but I don't have that. And so you have to find another way to be grounded. And again, your identity, not just as an athlete, but my identity as Cody Kessel, as a human being, what I bring to other human beings around me, my relationships um, and how I show up in my day to day life. And okay, that's grounded in your identity. Your identity is also changing all the time. So can we ground in where I come from, my family, these other things that ground us to the bigger forces in our life or whatever those may be. And I know you and I have had conversations about this gray zone, you know, we're not picking this one or zero or this black or this white, like 
or something. We're still maybe trying to figure out what's going on here in this gray mm-hmm. zone, but we can't. It's so easy when you when you can pick a one or a zero or a black and a white, um, but we're not there. And so then how do we work with that, if that makes sense? I mean, dude, yeah, like you said, you and I have had uh, long conversations about this before. And uh, I mean, I've I said this, I had a long conversation about this similar topic with uh, Micah Hancock, uh, yeah, female setter recently. And the same idea, right? Where it's like, <clears throat> oh man, I'm almost envious of someone who has just like chosen a religion and like, all right, this is just how the world works. And uh, like it, it, it relinquishes the control to someone else, you know, it's like, yeah. well, I'm not always God's in control, you know, yeah. and I am envious of in some strange way. And maybe that's not the best way to word it actually. But 100%. Like, I think, yeah, sorry. To, there's like a Da Vinci Code quote or something where he's like, yeah, I haven't been blessed with faith. You know, hmm. the, the guy asked him he, before he lets him in the library, he's like, are you a true believer? And he's like, I, I wish I was. Yeah. It'd be so nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I do genuinely feel that way sometimes. And, but I also do recognize that then my, that it doesn't mean I'm this like free spirited, loose ended, like that I can be grounded even in my non-belief, let's say, Yo, you know, but yeah, like, yeah. but it just takes, let's say a little more work to really understand then like, what is, what does ground me and how can I embody that? Right. Uh, so I don't know. What does that look like for you, bro? <laughs> it's it's it goes back to my values and yeah, you know, that's a, a changing process over time. And I even have them written down. So for me, it's love, joy, passion, grit, resilience, relationship, knowledge. Those are some of the ones that you know, I think. Mm-hmm. I, and you have to remind yourself of that. It's on my some of my bios. It's just like, what am I? Who am I? And what am I about? And maybe that's the better, you know, there's a, that's also from Reed Pretty, I think, or from other high performance sports psychologists. You can ask yourself those two questions. Who am I? What am I about? Journal for two or three minutes on it. And all of a sudden you find out pretty quick. And how can I bring that into my daily life and into my game and into who I am and what I believe and how I live? So, mm. Man, I... Because we, we get to define ourselves, right? Like, that's the other beauty of this side of it. It's like... Um, who am I? What am I about? All of a sudden we get to decide that. Yeah. And it reminds me of like, you know, it, even for someone, let's say who's chosen a religion like Christianity, every Sunday they go and remind themselves what their purpose is or why they're here. And I think it's such a good, something that someone, at least for myself in my position can learn from is like, what's going to ground, like, let's call it that church is grounding for Christians, right? It's like, what grounds me? What's my church? Well, what's my church? But like, in terms of like, who I am as a human being, it's like, what reminders do I have? And that's why I think it's so powerful. Like community is so powerful. And that can be tough, right? Like, you go to church, you're surrounded by all these people who believe exactly what you believe. Exactly, agree on the same thing. And uh, I think sometimes like, we don't like for myself, it's like, I don't always have that. And then guess what? I'm all alone, you know, like I'm, I'm out by myself and like, you know, you're with teammates who, you know, English isn't their first language. And like, so you're not going to be able to normally have these like really in-depth conversations about like, who are you as a person? Like, what are we doing here? You know? And so I think it becomes more difficult to be grounded. So I'm, I'm, I guess just to kind of finish off on this subject, like I am really interested in like, do you have any specific habits or things that kind of like help you stay grounded do you have those people in your life you talk to do you have certain habits or rituals that kind of help remind you of like oh yeah this is who I am and this is what I believe yeah great question it's it's books a lot of times I think that's helped me through a lot of seasons overseas when you get that lonely feeling you know that Mm. all kinds of books and reading and learning of course my relationships with my family my friends my girlfriend quickly what are you what are you reading right now Oh, I actually, for the book, I stopped re- I'm reading just a functional, like a functional weight training book, but what am I, no, I'm reading another great book. It's by Chris Bosch. I can highly recommend this one too. This was kind of my letters to a young athlete. It's oh, full cool. of other great stuff too. It's not that I modeled it off of mine, but there's, you know, he had an amazing career and was a, was a really good writer too. So I think that's a good yeah. one to check out. Um, I quoted in the book a couple, one or two times, um, but yeah, uh, 
maybe I don't do it enough. Maybe I need to get back to to that. You know, again, who am I? What am I about? It's maybe like you and you I said, should start our own community church, in dude. the church. Yeah, let's do it. We'll have no, it's, down. Uh, it's important, and yeah, it, the community thing is huge. You know, it it's built into our teams, but those are so fleeting and changing so often, right? You have mm. a community, you have a group, but it is tougher to have these deeper conversations, these longer conversations. So. Yeah, you, I, but you're creating you're creating a community right now. So no, you are out, too, dude. No, base. I mean, yeah, yeah, yes, for sure. I mean, and that's that's why I love that's my goal, I guess, in some way with the podcast is to to make it something where it's like I get to know more about Cody as a human being. So that way, when I see you and we're playing together or we're playing against each other, it's like we have this deeper relationship than just like because you know if volleyball is our volleyball is let's say our shared religion, you know, and playing the game is our church, you know more or less and uh, so it's nice to have that like deeper uh level of meaning and i hope people also can connect because i think there's so when i think about like at least sports community it's like man who from any sport to me i don't see a lot of like uh understanding who people like who's tom brady like as a human yeah. being really actually like, deeply you know, really well yeah. they, they did a huge uh, uh documentary series on him which was super interesting but even then it's like you know so I'm, I'm happy that we get to have these kind of conversations. And uh, I do want to like mention a few things also. You, you talk about uh, also this idea of like managing your energy and uh, almost like scheduling in time to chill. Do you feel like uh, that that has become more important to you as you've gotten older? Or like, what did you mean by that? Yeah, the, the one, this is more written to myself at Princeton when I was so type A, go, go, go all the time where I did almost need to schedule in downtime because otherwise I didn't get any. Um, you know, the classic thing my mom says, you know, we're human beings, not human doings, or, you know, just, you need to just be classic less doing, mom. less doing, more being, Cody, mm. just be. Mm. <laughs> you can, uh, it, especially at Princeton, it was so much with uh, being a student athlete, the homework, with the, the course load, with everything else that you wanted to do, social life, it was just go, go, go. and. Um, I think, of course, this idea is becoming more popular now, but making sure that if you have a, even if you have a really difficult practice, everyone knows that your body naturally responds to needs this downtime, but it's just so crucial. So in that chapter, I not only talk about even in the course of a match, even how I'm hyper-focusing after the whistle uh, and then kind of letting it go in between points, you know, we know if weightlifting, how long we need to take in between sets, we know that's important for different outcomes. So just take that idea also into the rest of your life. If you have kind of a schedule and where can, where's the time to just be? Because so, that's, there's so many good things that happen when we let that happen. Man, first of all, I can't empathize with you more on this feeling of being like, go, go, or rather for me at least, because I think I'm a very like stonery, chillish looking California dude, probably. <laughs> you know, I'm like pretty mellow in that way. But I'm also very like, feel like I should be doing something, you know? And again, I talked about this with Micah too, this, this idea of like letting yourself chill. And that volleyball is like, we get so ramped up with volleyball and that like, it wouldn't be a huge surprise that that carries into our life outside of volleyball, you know, like yeah. that, that our career has that type of impact on like who we are outside of our sport. And so now what I'm super interested in is like, how did you manage this concept of chill and and scheduling in yeah. time to chill i think is it's sad to me that now i'm like yeah. oh my dude. when i was in like high school and shit i was just the chillest dude of all time you know <laughs> do whatever i'm down with whatever and i still feel like i'm that way but uh i feel like now i was just saying this to someone the other my mom the other day where it's like dude i'll, I'll be watching like tv and being like i should probably also be working on something because there's yeah. some i'm building an academy the pod there's so much i want to make merch drop for the, the podcast i want to there's one, always you something drop to the, do you gotta drop the guilt yeah yeah for sure and you know, exactly it's like i don't want to be shaming myself but at the same time we are that like small percentage maybe of people i don't want to say small percentage of people yeah. but like elite high level kind of athletes at least that it's like that 
then gets brought and dripped into other areas of my life where I just like, I don't want to just have a middle blocker Academy. I want to have the best middle, the best in the world, the best. And I want it to look (laughs) sick. And I want the content to be like shot professionally by freaking Scorsese, you know, like, or whatever, dude. And so I'm so interested to know too, because now, now I was just talking about like having, bringing it back, all comes back to church, dude. Like this (laughs) idea, this idea of like having a Sabbath, you know, or like having your day to just like, all right, today, no matter what, even though I'm about to release my book and whatever, like I'm not, I need this day to chill. How did you manage that in writing a book and also still playing, you know? Yeah. First thing is it took a long time. I think it wasn't just something that I really needed to just destroy in one season or two seasons to get it out. It's like little, it was little bits here and there that I would mm. gather from lessons. So, and how long did it take crew, you to write? With, basically over two years and with a lot of creative at least for me with my creative work when I write it will like flow for a day or two or three and then shut off for two or three weeks and I think that's Mm. totally normal to and okay to accept of Mm. course if we're doing something like with a professional technical outcome we want to want to schedule everything we want to have accountability but for me when it's more creative work it's really difficult to force it. And of course, if you need output, if it's your job or something, yeah, you're going to have to schedule in that time, show up every day, and then and then that will come. But the book was really not that way, not scheduled that way. Hmm. I think that's so beautiful, dude. I Man, you're, you're making me think because I'm, I feel like with so much of the content and stuff that I'm trying to do, I'm constantly battling this like I feel like, and I think you feel maybe the same, like the artistic and creative side of it to me, A, is the most fulfilling. And B, I think it's like, I care so much about putting out something that I can look back on and be like, that was sick or that was hilarious or that is dope. Like, you know, and and being that like harsh critic, you yeah. know, and being, and then trying to find the balance between like, well, in order to write a book, you know what it's i think about it like in order to read a book they say like read 10 pages a day and guess what by the end of the month you read the book Ooh, whereas, like, whereas like for me i'm like i'm like i love this book like i'm reading this book on breathing you know by yeah. james nestor breath and i'm like reading it and i'll read it like three chapters in a night or something and i'm like i'm all in and now it's all i think about and mouth then, tape like, on yeah mouth tape is on by the way been doing it for two weeks been quite interesting um but like mouth tape on just like reading this book exactly and then uh I'll read it for like three days in a row before I go to bed. And then one night I'll be like, I want to watch Seinfeld or like something. And the next night it's the office. And then, then the next thing you know, it's like, I'm going to bed watching shows. And now I haven't read the book in like a week or two, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah. So what is, what is that like? What was that like for you being like, you're right. You do need to like have some, like, how do you, how did you manage? It is important to have deadlines when it comes to like a business or something that you want to put out there because if you didn't have some sort of deadline or actually yeah. I don't really know I haven't written a book so don't fucking listen to me but like yeah. how, how do you I could imagine like having a deadline at least for me is an important step in getting shit done and at the same time I don't want to compromise the creativity and to your point that seems to like like everything and like have this ebb and flow where it's like I feel super creative for a couple of days and then I'm like I don't want anything to do with it totally yeah, I, I thought I was going to publish it in November and, you know, it wasn't until Jan. So it's like a, there was definitely a big push where I was, um, that was kind of the self deadline I had for myself. And then I would just get so worked up and my girlfriend would kind of be like, hey, it's okay. You can give it a few more weeks until, you know, you really like it. And even I think you're also supposed to do uh, like a, a, a pre-launch and do it really sl- like let release the book really slowly, build up a lot of anticipation. I didn't really do that either. I just was like, it's done. Now I want to get it out. <laughs> bam, bam, bam. Um, but I'm still just so happy how it turned out and it's totally fine. So um, yeah, it's, it's like the, it's just with everything. It's um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing to add to what you said. No, that's, that's so sick. Um, I'm really curious. Uh, did you use any AI technology to help you write? I it? did not. And I was pissed about that. Or like, I would totally use it for my next one as a research assistant or a side assistant, but it was, it came out, you know, basically a month when I was basically done with the manuscript. So for sure, I will use it in the future as a helper. And I think it can be really valuable for that. But I was almost like, Oh, now, you know, everyone's going to be writing books, but I think, I think it's not the same. I think you can tell it's written in my voice and written by me. And of course you can train AI now to write in your voice and do all these things. But I think I even tweeted and I was like, Hey, this is a human written 
book. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think these new tools are incredible and they're going to make everyone, dude. I, they're going to help everyone in so many ways. So I freaking will never forget uh, at, uh, what was it world champs where you and I were like, you, you sent me this message and you were like, dude, 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 AI dude. Over, dude like so freaking out over AR and we were just freaking out over like all the images you could make too. Yeah. Um, can we just geek out about AI and like some of the like tech stuff? Because I agree. It looks like I'm just seeing more and more, like I was thinking, I saw something posted recently and it was talking about like uh, AI, like basically you can like write in a subject and it'll, it'll basically write essays. So like now for homework for kids, like yeah. what's happening? Dude? Really, really nutty. Right. And also concerning on the same time, but the the first it's like, we maybe are going to be drowning in more mediocre content, but maybe missing deeper content like this, where we're able to have a deep conversation about who we really are, how we really feel, these mm. kind of things. Of, but at the same time, if you're a great artist and you just have an amazing tool who's on 24 seven, it can help you be a better artist, better writer, better editor, better photographer, all these things. Mm. I just don't see the downside to that. It's going to help so many people. Um, of course, as as a learner and a writer, I would say I don't know if I. It's concerning to me as like I, because I, I don't know if I'd be able to write. But it's just going to change. It's going to change, and it's going to be okay. I think is the other side of things. People always think it's all going to ruin, but um, dude, this is actually really crazy. My, it's probably like forty five, fifty mile an hour winds or something. It's. Ooh. It's so insanely windy. This morning, I woke me up. My house is like whistling. Any little crack in the house is like. Oh. Okay. Anyways, not to get too distracted there. Uh, my power. I want to say my power shut off, but it looks like the AI did not like us talking <laughs> shit about it, dude. Uh, but it is. I don't remember exactly where we were, but I'll tell you this. Yeah. I, I do. You, like, as someone who's like tinkered around with like some of the different features, maybe of AI stuff. Like, I actually did want to ask you, like. Uh, because I remember when we were first like messing around with AI tech, let's say it was like, yeah. uh, you could type in, for example, owl. And I want to get into like why you seem to be obsessed with owls or an owl <laughs> represents you. Um, but like you could type in like owl Monet color, like crayon drawing or something. And you'd get all these images of like these, like never ever drawn or never shall be drawn yeah. again images. Like it's insane. It's insane. It's totally insane. And the the equivalent of that is happening with music. It's happening with writing. It's happening with, it's just going to explode. Yes. Yes. Where, you know, within a matter of minutes, you're able to create a radio pop sounding beat, backbeat. And you go, oh man, that's actually, that's actually pretty good. And then, you know, you know, if you actually know what you're doing, you can go in and fix it and make a, a you know, a, a winner. Oh, dude. Yeah. Yo, I mean, this is crazy, dude. It's really, I think, a pretty insane inflection point that a lot of people don't realize yet. Of, you know, of course it's not gonna, but it's gonna change a lot. I think. I mean, yeah. It, think about like if you started a brand. I just saw some other thing where it's like if you have a brand and you have like a concept, you can type in that concept and it'll make you a bunch of images for a YouTube banner, for this, for merch stuff. Dude, it's almost like uh, you made this joke of that, like your book was like human written. I almost <laughs> feel like there's going to be some yeah. like books or music or things are going to have stamps like a person. Pre-GPT, post-GPT. Something, totally. dude, for sure. That's crazy. Yeah. It's, um, it's wild, dude. Let's be it's honest. Really wild. It's so wild. Yeah. And I can't, I'm, I'm just the part i have to remember is i'm just so excited to be able to see it all go down hopefully you know like see what what happens because of it um but i did i do remember that you ended up doing like tons of uh <laughs> i'm sure you somewhere on your computer you have like tons of uh owl drawings what is your just... deal with owls bro? <laughs> the owl it's on thing, your book yeah. too it's, isn't it on the front cover of your book Let's, too? we gotta clarify the owl thing can we so please it it's um there's a where do I start with the owl story? So they've always been before, uh, before Germany, before any of this, they've shown up at random points in my life. And I've always been a fan of them, kind of a spirit animal of mine, where I come from in Colorado, the 
they're known as the symbol of um, yeah wisdom truth awareness insight and one of my favorite singers trevor hall uh did a song and where he talks about owl medicine and owl medicine gets to the idea of knowing ourselves and truly understanding ourselves kind of the things we're talking about now about um where are we in this gray zone how can we ground ourselves who am i what am i about and when you get clarity on that it can be so powerful for whatever situation you're going through so and then two seasons ago or last season it was last season it was through a covid pause and i was getting bone chips removed from my ankle i was out for four weeks and i gave an interview with a reporter and i said hey you know i i know something's wrong with my body i'm kind of feeling it and i just have to trust that and make sure that this gets out of there and, and um i'm trusting in my owl medicine <laughs> and that translates very strangely to german also in english everyone's like Ooh, what is going on with owl medicine um i came back in record time you're supposed to take six weeks i came back in three weeks from the surgery worked my tail off but came back and helped us win a, a match at home off the bench. And, uh, but after the interview, the bounce house, they do a really great thing uh, promoting in our sport mm -hmm. for the German league. And they made fun of it in a really funny way. And I was embraced it. I was like, actually, I am crazy about owls. I love them. I think they're great. And it just became this, this big meme in the league. And yeah, I've embraced it because of the, they, they mean a lot to me and other random points in my life they've shown up to to guide me you know so just grounded to nature i've always been grounded to nature in that way and to the animals that surround us and the way that we're a part of all that so it's gonna it all sounds very woo woo but for me it's uh, it's been a powerful thing and just got it that owl reminds me of okay who am i right so mm. uh when i think of an owl i think of uh that like is it Tootsie Pop, dude? I don't remember who oh, the company is. How many is. licks does it take? <laughs> how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop, dude? And I, I got to be honest, have you ever tried? Have you ever tried that? Like, I, I remember think we all did as a kid, but it's no, like, I remember just, doing it too, but I'm like, I can't get more. I start counting 10, 11 licks, and I'm like, I'll be here all day, bro. Just Let me just fish. take a big bite of it and get to that damn Tootsie Pop, bro. <laughs> Uh, um so so just to be clear owl medicine like do you have a guy you know that maybe like oh no i don't um but trevor hall is a an artist a musician who's been very uh, he's got some great albums and he's been i've been following for a long time so he speaks about it in his dreams and how they showed up you know they showed up in his life and a lot of times uh the lakota which also have in colorado a lot of uh, places they're dream interpreters interpret owls as um, a sign if they're in show up in dreams it's that someone's fooling you and so he trevor was telling the story and it's the same for me he was saying so, so i was trying to figure out who 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 is fooling me this all, all this time is it which people around me are are fooling me or and he ends up after a year or two ends up finding that uh, he's fooling himself mm -hmm. from what from what he really wants from what he really needs you know who are we where do we come from what do we need these questions can lead to a lot of awareness and self-discovery and awareness of another owl thing of just being aware and finding that inner truth for you whatever that means so that mm -hmm. reminds the owl reminds me of all a bunch of those different things truth wisdom learning awareness but most of all inner knowledge and that inner inner work so can i can i ask you just kind of as like we I want to, I want to res respect a little bit of our, our time here for let you enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I am, I am really interested in like, when I talk to people who are over 30, especially like how much longer are you thinking you're going to do this, bro? There's some days where I'm going to do it until my body falls apart. And some days you're like, wow, I don't know if I can, you know, spiritually, energetically, if I have what it takes to, to ride or especially to even, I still think I'm going like this with my career trajectory, but I know there's a lot of players that aren't the type of players that will ride it on the way back down. Mm. You know, if they stop feeling like they're going up, they, they don't want to go down in leagues or down in whatever. Um, I might be able to, but there's so many other decisions that come in life uh, and relationships and goals that are going to define that. So how about you? How about me, dude? 
I'm, hey man, I'm right there with you. You know, in some ways I feel like I'm peaking. In other ways, I feel like it takes so much more. I have to put so much more energy into the things that I didn't, I didn't feel like I normally even had to think about, you know? Um, yeah. I, I know that living in Poland is a hell of a sacrifice. And in fact, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, like, I feel like Berlin is like a nice combination, like for places to play and live. I feel like it's got to have a lot more like life balance. Like, do you like, do you like living in Berlin? So much. Yeah. So much. Yeah. And it, the, also the, the club, the professionalism that they bring and situation to be a pro athlete here is pretty awesome. Um, and then on top of that, dude, I really wanted to know, like, because your role there has changed, you know, yeah. sometimes you've been like the starting guy. You had that streak. Was it two years ago where you were like, you were fucking on fire, dude. I remember seeing tons of posts about you. And then, uh, yeah. and then there's times where like, you're also a guy that comes off the bench. Uh, Great question. How, yeah. How, how do you, how do you manage that? And then when it comes to contracts, like why not go play somewhere where like, you're the main guy, like what is the real difference there? You know? Totally. I, I've had offers to move to different countries and I love the role and the, the team here that I've just embraced. And in practice, the reality for the past few years has looked like that oftentimes I'm playing against the A side and that is one of the best teams in the world or a very, very strong team on any given day mm. that is driving me in training. So it's a great level that I'm playing against. I have the opportunity to be a leader on the team. I have to be ready at any moment. And I love the challenge of being able to compete for a Champions League team. You know, for, for years, I played for Lunenburg as a starter, was the main guy. And I've embraced the role as this fighter, you know, kind of seventh, eighth man off the bench when we need that energy boost. And that's also maybe changed how I've what energies I choose. Because as a starter, sometimes you have to choose maybe more of this calmness, the steadiness. But as a guy off the bench, you know, if you're coming for a few points, that also is going to change your role on the team. So you got to come and bring in that younger, heat, baby. Yeah. For the younger athletes out there, you know, don't be afraid to have conversations with your coach of what your role on the team is. And I get that, get into that in the book is that's under your complete control is to embrace the role that you're given. Hmm. And, um, what would you say to and that kid? That's a beauty. Like, that's a beauty of team sport, right? It's like yeah. I can be part of something greater than myself and my own ego. What would you say then to that kid who's like on the bench, but they think they should be starting and they're upset? Because there's a lot totally. of those kids out there who are there's like, so many I'm on the bench. Kids. I don't get it because my mom's been complaining to the club director. I should probably oh, be getting put in. Like, totally. what do you say to that kid? I tell them to get to flip to the what's in your control chapter. You know, the dichotomy of control chapter one and two. Even as a professional, I can't control my coach's decision of who is starting. You know, he's going to make that decision for the best of the team, for the best of the club, for however they see that. But I can control about 20 other things, being ready for every opportunity, you know, coming in, doing extra work, figuring out what my role on the team is and how I can embrace that. And those, those are conversations that are difficult because that, those can change throughout a season. Those roles can change because sometimes you're battling for a spot and then it's you know, what is it? Storming, forming, and norming. These these phases that teams go through. It's like and Call of so Duty might, talk? What is that? Yeah, right. <laughs> but you might be in a different spot. You know, sometimes teams are battling for starting spots as you get towards the end of the season or the middle of the season. Hey, this is kind of how they see things. And accept that and then still work and fight like for every opportunity that you have in training. Just make sure that you're controlling all the controllables before you start or and before you start just saying, I just deserve to because why? Because what? Mm. What are you actually putting the work in? Do you have the work and the confidence to back it up of what you're saying that you deserve? Because maybe there's a gap there with the coach or maybe there's a different understanding, but 99% of the time, the coach is not doing it because he has a personal grudge against the player. Sure, sure. Well, dude, uh, I, my, my last my last little thought here is um, I know I mentioned before, before it's like, how much longer are you going to do this? And my thought now is more like, what else are you like interested in? Like, it was so fascinating for me. I didn't even realize that you were like a history major at Princeton. Like, 
I feel like that's just such a cool thing to have decided to like focus your energy into is history. And it's so funny because for me, it's like when I was a kid, I didn't give a shit about history. I was like, why do I need to learn all this old shit? Why do I need to like for like some Scantron test about dates and Christopher Columbus or whatever? Like, why do I need to learn <laughs> yeah. this shit? And now as yeah. I get older, I'm just like, oh man, history is actually so cool because there are so many like we all have these different paths and different you know eras that we lived in, but like the lessons that we can take away with the yeah. human beings hasn't really changed that much, you know? hundred percent. It's Why so, were you so, were you so fascinated with history. It's so grounding. And I just had great professors and storytellers. I think you would be a naturally great historian because you're a natural storyteller. You're a natural conversationalist or you want to understand and be grounded in no. the human experience. You're and saying that because I got that long hair no, and I could grow it down what, to my butt. And... <laughs> that would, you would be, I, mean, I had, I had teachers and personalities, history teachers like you growing up and they made it an amazing subject. And it was just the human experience told through so many stories and cultures. And you learn a lot of things about why, why are things the way that they are? And you learn mm -hmm. that pretty quick. And that was just, it was, it's like you learn a little bit about everything kind of. And of course you go deep. I went, went deep into sports history to understand why, why United States and Canada are the only places that really have school and sport like this why volleyball is a girl sport in the united states i really wanted to get into that and uh, so i talk all about that in the thesis or people who are interested can reach out it's i have a lot of answers long answers but um you know i wrote wrote a mini book on it but wait okay we don't need to dive too deep into your thesis here yeah, that's crazy I'll try to but give like you the spark notes yeah please give me like a quick little summary oh yeah i'll try to do a quick summary um so I'll be, can I be honest, dude? I always yeah, thought that yeah. Shoot. that uh, that it was like for some creepy reason that that women's volleyball was like number one because women play in bikinis and people uh, want to yeah. watch it. Like I don't know if that's true at all, but like, or or <laughs> oh, the mean, other the other thought was like that women's volleyball is like a little bit slower and easier to follow, and so yeah. like long rallies are exciting and like I could imagine that's also another thing, um, but I don't yeah. know. So uh, my thesis looked, wanted to be kind of original. I wanted to look at the very early days of the sport. So 1895 to 1945, it tracks how the sport was, you know, invented in the YMCA, invented in the United States, taken by the YMCA around the world. And then in World War I, the American army picked the YMCA to run their physical fitness program and they brought volleyball with them. No way. And for the longest time, the volleyball was not, it was in between this it was like this amateur thing that the women could play or anyone without equipment could play and it was just this kind of backyard amateur sport but at the same time it was developing a very powerful professional side of it that made its way to europe anyway if you fast forward a lot a lot you get to title nine and this you know it's the 70s in the united states where men's and women's educational opportunities need to stay equal mm. that includes sports and we don't have an equivalent for men's football so we have to find an equivalent on the women's side. And that volleyball was the perfect fit for that. So that's why to this day, you still have four and a half scholarships for guys at the division one level and 12 for women's on an indoor mm -hmm. team and why they have beach volleyball. That's kind of the elephant in the room about the top level growth. So that's why I also give a percentage back to the First Point Volleyball Foundation from my book because it's helping add opportunities for men to play at, mm -hmm. at these levels because then you get the trickle down the kid, you know, the parents that want the scholarships, there's, there's 10,000 or whatever for the women, they're able to invest more in the youth side. And that's why in the United States, it's a girl's sport in the rest of the world. It is, it's this manliness and this toxic masculinity and all this, this muscular Christianity, even that goes back uh, to 1895, even. And so I try wow. to track that through my thesis, but you also why volleyball is in the military. You see it so you know the top gun you see it in top gun that. that's right dude. yeah so that's right a bunch of these threads kind of all weave together that's so fascinating dude that i always that's so funny and of course i'm just like this big idiot that like anecdotally i've just heard that like oh you know the women play in bikinis and good people love no, well, women it's play california in you know california and hawaii are, or other areas are different because it gets introduced as like a, hey this is just a normal sport or this is mm -hmm. like a there's not that stigma around it still that, you know, of course it's going away and of course it's changing, but for so long, it's still shaking that. And, mm. and yeah, we just need to understand it a little bit better so we can better move forward with how we're growing the game. You know, it's the most widely played sport there, you know, okay. Soccer is up there, but the FIVB has the most affiliated nations. It's the, it's the largest political organization in the world is the FIVB. Mm. 
in terms of 220 nations. So. Yeah, and you're you're totally right about like not only it being so popular on the women's side, but I keep seeing like women's professional leagues popping up. Like it's yeah, they're it's, they're it's starting to really like... figure it out. I'm so excited for like women's opportunity to play professional yeah. volleyball like 10, 15, 20 years from now. They're and I also the gap. Yeah, they are, dude. And I also would love to see that um on the men's side. Though that's really cool that you're donating some of the proceeds to to first point volleyball. That's really dope. Yeah, the, um, the okay. women's side, you know, there's 10,000 scholarship players or something. And so many of them, a hundred or two end up playing in Europe after that. So it's not enough, right? There's, there's the players there that are playing at a super high level and we'd love to be able to keep them playing. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay. So last thing, like, what, what do you, you think you're going to be a history teacher when you're done? You're going to follow off your dad's footsteps. You're going to figure out how to organize sports. For no you idea. For no idea. What's, what's going I'm, on? I'm at uh, my sister, drives my sister nuts, but I'm kind of a plan A the plan a until plan a doesn't work and then i'll figure out plan b i, I, I kind of do i do believe in that if you make a plan b you end up with plan b i'm kind of hardcore about that so wow. i'm just riding plan a until it runs out and then i'll figure it out later so plan a Dude, is I, I continue that. to become the best i can be and i'm just not gonna you know okay I, the book is a side it's a passion project on the side but i'm not about to become a, a guru author uh, like i'm still still me a pro volleyball player so uh it's fucking really cool dude that's really cool and i man i appreciate so much your time this was this was so so amazing and i'm just awesome. like i'm so I, glad we got to chat yeah this is amazing and dude you you wrote a fucking book dude that's so fucking cool <laughs> like honestly it's the coolest <laughs> thing and i to your point it's like you are focusing solely on trying to be the best volleyball athlete you can be all on top of that you took the time to like write a book and wait just this is now i'm just being selfish as someone who has like other tasks he's trying to do as a professional athlete also so you yeah. you kind of you kind of mentioned that you wrote for like two or three days um but like did you have like a every week i need to do a chapter kind of thing or did you literally just like let it go at its own pace it was sometimes on the road i would try to make it a habit to get a little bit done every time i went on the road which for us is a lot yeah for sure so little bit habits here and there that started to add up but if you're not feeling it you're also not feeling it you don't have to force it so yeah i love that um, man that's really helpful I, for me yeah also. That's, that's but i also cool. want to thank you because you're getting stories out in a digestible form that hopefully more people will hear you know i know not everyone's going to go buy and read a book so the, the videos, the, the podcast, it's all so awesome and helps the sport grow and share stories in so many ways. So, Oh, dude, really, this is this awesome. is actually, to me, what it's about is getting to highlight players who not just have cool stories and are unique people, but also who are doing dope shit for the volleyball community. This is the best. Um, so just, just now I want you to use this as your time. Like, where can people follow what you're doing? Where can people buy the book? Like, please plug uh, everything yeah. you need to. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. It's all at Cody Kessel, C-O-D-Y-K-E-S-S-E-L. You can find me all over there. Reach out any any way by email. You can find that all on my social links. And it's, it's all there. I'm very, very reachable and open. Also with a link for the book. And yeah, just would love to hear it. So again, just to create global what's, sport. What's the name of the book? 11 Ways to Get an Edge. So smart, dude. Having some sort of countdown is so is so nice, you know. <laughs> I, even when I was reading the book, I was just like, "Oh yeah, we're on chapter number three next now, or number one. five now." Yeah, it's so nice. That's so, <laughs> that's so great that you did it that way for me, the dumb caveman. Yeah. No, um, no, this is great. I, and maybe there there's even a, a way. It would be really cool to I don't know have some sort of like code or something we could use to help promote or like listeners to promote. I don't know. Maybe we could talk for about sure, that after. For sure, a hundred percent, we can figure out a code. It can be. Um... Yeah, for any listeners of the pod, I will put together a special discount. Let's we'll do that. we'll do something that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, for um, sure. But Happy but otherwise, it's that. fucking eleven dollars, you cheap fucks. Like, just buy the book, dude. Like, help support <laughs> I, I, so volleyball going players. Up. Come on, it's going up. So it better, dude. <laughs> it freaking better go up. You spent I don't know two years writing something, you get eleven dollars. Like, come on, people. Are you kidding me? Price like, damn. Up. Yeah, hell yeah, it should. <laughs> All right, dude. I love you so much. Thank you so much yeah. for being on here. Truly. Man, I love you, man, too. It's been awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Peace, baby. Later.